Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I invite you to take a seat and uh, to put your mobile phones on the <clears throat> quiet position. My name is Alberto Piagesi and I am co-moderating this session of diabetic foot infection and in its impact on limb amputation with uh, Stefan Morbach, my friend and colleague, which is too lazy to come to the desk. But uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, the session. As you know, diabetic foot infection is a major uh, issue. And uh, in the recent years, is worsening uh, and worsening because of the growing resistance of bacteria and the shortening of uh, uh, antibacterial agents and uh, the spreading of uh, the condition among uh, elderly and fragile patients. And um, uh, right away, I'm starting uh, introducing the first speaker, who is uh, my long-lasting friend, Edgar Peters, who is coming from the uh, university, the VU University Medical Center in Amsterdam. Edgar is an infectious disease specialist and consultant and uh, contributed in the producing the, uh, a lot of evidence on this issue in the recent years, and I'm pleased to give him the speech. Please. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, chairs and uh, organizing committee for having me here. Um, I work as an infectious disease specialist in Amsterdam. And uh, other than being from Amsterdam, I don't have any relevant disclosures. Um, this is what I will be talking about briefly. Some about the epidemiology, some of the definition of infection, some theoretical considerations, some on systemic antibiotics, topical antimicrobials, and I'll come to a conclusion. And while I'm giving the talk on the right side of the screen, you can keep track of where I am in the talk. Okay, first, the uh, epidemiology, briefly. The incidence um, uh, uh, ranges from a lifetime risk of 4% to a three-year risk of 9%. So four-year percent would be in um, uh, primary care centers and um, uh, the three-year risk would be in tertiary care centers. Now, 50% of the foot ulcers are infected at presentation. And of the amputations, 60% are a direct result of uh, infected foot ulcers. And it comes with a price. Without an amputation, um, it, it will cost about 20,000 euros. And if you treat infection with an amputation, 38,000 euros. And how do we define infection then? Well, there's some different types of definitions that you can use. You can use uh, definition bioburden, which would be uh, viable microorganisms on a surface, being a table, but it could also be a wound. Uh, colonization, microbiological multiplication without tissue invasion uh, or immunological reaction. And critical colonization would be uh, wounds that fail to heal due to colonization. But the uh, most common used definition for infection would be invasion and multiplications of microorganisms into the tissue, uh, which lead to an inflammatory response to tissue damage and the diagnosis is based on clinical signs and symptoms. Now, I will be talking about that definition of infection in the rest of the talk. And um, if I then look at how uh, you can define infection further, uh, I use the um, uh, IDSA uh, guideline definition or the International Working Group definition, which are about the same. And infection grade one would be no infection, grade two, an infection localized in the skin, uh, and it has at least two signs or symptoms of inflammation, being swelling, redness, pain, warmth, and pus. Now, a moderate infection would be a grade three infection, and that would be a larger area of erythema, or a deep infection, an abscess, osteomyelitis, arthritis, or fasciitis. And grade four would be a serious infection where you would have a previously defined foot infection plus systemic signs and symptoms. So uh, fever, 
uh, a tachycardia, so a fast pulse, increased respiratory frequency, and leukocytosis or leukopenia. And if you then have an infection with two or more of those SIRS criteria, that is defined as sepsis. And you could also um, uh, uh, could use that for pneumonia if it wasn't a foot infection but a lung infection. And um, it predicts outcome. As you can see in this slide, 1,666 patients in South Texas in the United States. Um, if you would grade uh, patients uh, according to infection severity, you would see an increase in hospitalizations in the higher, uh, more severe infection groups and more low, lower extremity amputations. Now, there's some other signs and symptoms as, as well that have been used and that are associated with um, a colonization or, 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 or a growth of more than 10 to the fifth colony forming units, bacteria per gram of tissue, and those signs would include friable granulation tissue, uh, uh, bad smell, wound breakdown, undermining or pocketing, delayed healing, serous exudate. But uh, the data to support the use of those criteria are not really strict, and they're merely supported by expert opinion. Now, there are also uh, associations of bacteria that grow in wound and um, um, other things. For instance, uh, there have been studies that showed that um, a lot of bacteria in wounds are associated with a decrease in angiogenesis, decrease in wound contraction, granulation tissue, and epithelial migration, and also with a decrease in uh, immune defense. Um, well, whether one thing is the cause or the effect, I'm not entirely sure. But it could also be that uh, wounds that fail to heal because they're not properly offloaded, for instance, or because they have, uh, 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 or the patient has vascular disease, are more colonized with those type of bacteria. So the wheels might also be turning the other way around, where that would cause the uh, colonization of, infection, uh, of uh, microorganisms. So what are the theoretical interventions that we could do as clinicians to prevent an ulcer from becoming infected. We could do mechanical debridement, so remove the bacteria and remove necrosis. We could give systemic antibiotic treatment, topical treatment. We could passively remove the bacteria by absorbing it in a dressing. And we can improve the immune system. And finally, we can all adhere to hygienic measures. Now, what would be the theoretical advantages of those local interventions? Well. One of them would be, uh, one of the side effects would be that uh, sometimes if you use a moist um, uh, dressing or a, a fatty tr dressing, you can have maceration of the wound edges. And some of the dressings can be toxic to human cells as well. Uh, usually, those uh, topical agents come with a higher price. And uh, there have been some interesting studies that showed that, in contrast to what I told you earlier, that uh, um, uh, there might be slower healing if there are no bacteria present in a wound. And if you want to look at those uh, papers, you can look for them in the Gottrip paper in Journal of Wound Care in 2013. Now, the pros and cons of antimicrobial treatment, if you do not yet have an infection, well, you might have faster healing, amputation prevention and infection prevention, but it will come with a price, namely higher cost, more side effects, for instance, Clostridium difficile, um, uh, diarrhea, and development of resistance. And as an infectious disease specialist, I'm particularly worried about that aspect of uh, antimicrobial treatment. Because when penicillin was introduced in the uh, uh, early 40s in the Second World War, it was heralded as the well, the panacea, you could cure any type of infection you would like. But gradually, we saw more and more resistance. First, we saw penicillin resistance in the early 50s, and then MRSA in the early 60s, and now even vancomycin resistance, step is that red box in the uh, right lower corner. And it wouldn't surprise you that the first seven cases of vancomycin resistance, step aureus, have been described in diabetic foot patients. Now, this is an even more frightening image. This is Europe, which by itself is not frightening. But the different colors represent um, uh, resistance to carbapenem uh, by Klebsiella pneumonia. And as you can see in the uh, lower right corner, Greece, uh, 
they have more than 50% carbapenem resistance in their Klebsiella, which would mean well, we use carbapenems as a last resort against those type of bacteria. So um, we might be entering a, um, um, a post-antibiotic era earlier than we think. Well, I'd like to uh, go to a different subject. How can we then prevent uh, infection in the diabetic foot? Well, the Yuma document gives us some answers, and also um, um, uh, the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot has performed a systematic review to interventions that you could do in infection of the diabetic foot. And in that International Working Group um, uh, review, we uh, have looked at 7,500 articles and identified 29 trials to interventions in diabetic foot infections, of which 12 were studies to antibiotics and seven were in osteomyelitis. And we found no studies um, that were specifically aimed at the prevention of infection. There have been uh, uh, two studies that looked at the prescription of antibiotics to improve wound healing. One of them was this study, uh, 44 patients, uh, where they found that there were 10 patients in the placebo group that healed versus six in the antibiotic group, but they did not give any data on clinical infection. Another one was a study where they gave parenteral ceftriaxone, so uh, intramuscularly, for six weeks versus placebo, and they compared it with historical controls, and, um, well, they found asepsis, so no bacteria in five patients, but they didn't give any uh, data on infection, so clinical infection that I just talked about. Then can we do something else systemically? Can we improve the immune system? Because we know that in patients with diabetes, the immune system is, is not as good as in patients without uh, diabetes. For instance, if you have a higher glucose level on the x-axis, you can see the glucose level, you have less superoxide, superoxide bursts from the granulocytes. Um, uh, so that makes you more vulnerable to Staph aureus infection, for instance. Well, they've done five, we've identified five trials in the literature to granulocyte colony stimulating factor in diabetic foot infections, but unfortunately, no data on infection prevention. Now, how about topical um, measurements? Um, another a subgroup of the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot did a systematic review to topical um, applications of all kinds of things to improve wound healing. And what they found, that mechanical debridement, there were no data on infection prevention. So if you remove the tissue with a scalpel, well, it might improve wound healing, but there's no data on infection prevention. Um, what if you then passively remove the bacteria by applying a dressing, for instance, uh, an absorbent dressing or maybe even negative pressure wound therapy? Well, there are no data that suggests that it prevents infection. How about dressings then? Hydrofiber versus iodine versus a non-adherent dressing. Once randomized controlled trial in 370 patients, well, Professor Jeffcoat found no difference in wound healing and amputation, but didn't give any data on prevention of infection. How about hydrofiber versus alginate? Once again, no difference in incidence infection. How about honey versus iodine? Once again, no data on infection, but I, we'll, we were only able to look at the abstract because we didn't have the uh, Medical Journal of Malaysia at hand. Uh, Professor Piagesi has published a study on a topical antiseptic where he applied that to uh, uh, surgical patients where he did a, uh, a four-foot amputation most of the time. It was a non-blighted randomized controlled trial. He compared it to uh, iodine and he found that there was more reinfection in the iodine group, but it was a non-blinded study that looked at the long-term effect of one application during surgery. This is what they found on the left side, the superoxidized water and the um, um, uh, quantitative microbiology, so less bacteria grew after six months or after one month, and uh, in the iodine group, well, uh, a significant amount, more, a larger amount of bacteria grew. And this is the reinfection group, uh, superoxidized water, one reinfection, and iodine, nine reinfections. So that would be a positive study. How about tobramycin beads in wounds? No data on infection. How about hygiene? What we all do is we, of course, see patients and are bare below the elbows, not 
unlike these two doctors, where one of them wears a wedding band, one of them wears a watch, uh, he has long sleeves, the other one wears a tie and a lab coat. Well, there's some um, um, countries where uh, uh, um, uh, doctors are not even allowed to wear lab coats because supposedly they um, uh, spread infection. But um, unlike uh, popular thought, there are hardly any data on that um, uh, applying hygienic measures prevent infection in your patients. But we all do. I, I wouldn't advise you not to apply hygienic measures, but I'm just saying that there are hardly any data to support the, uh, the use. So why are there so few data then? Well, part of it is there's no funding for it because, um, well, agencies are not very likely to um, uh, fund studies that look into prevention. And uh, of course, pharmacological um, uh, companies are not really interested in funding those studies either. Most of the data that we have are uh, based on in vitro microbiological and resistance data. And in patients, uh, those bacteria are usually in the non-planktonic biofilm form and um, um, will have a different phenotype. So maybe that's why the antibiotics that we use do not work as well. And the definition of pre-infected states, that's a difficult one, what I just said. 10 to the fifth colony forming units per gram. I don't know how many of you do a quantitative uh, um, uh, culturing of wounds, but personally I don't because it's too difficult. So what I would like to uh, want all of you to know is that infection is a clinical diagnosis. It's defined clinically. And I'm not sure what the place of critical colonization or pre-infection is. There's little evidence on of, uh, of infection prevention in the diabetic foot, and we need more data, especially those with proper endpoints to topical treatment. And I personally believe that asepsis or not growing uh, bacteria in a wound is not a proper endpoint. Thank you. <laughs>